Guru Ve Gauri Chanjaya Radhika Yatadali Krishnaya Krishna Bhakta Yatada Bhakta Yanamona Maha Vancha Kalpa Trubhyascha Kripa Shindu Vebacha Patita Nam Pavani Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namona Maha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gaudhara Shri Vasari Gaudhavakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Dandavat Pranam devotees uh, Dandavat um, I am trying to catch up on some questions before um, obviously Wednesday for us here uh, is Janmastami Titi, and then of course is the uh, appearance day of our Srila Prabhupada uh, and Nandotsav. And uh, of course, then two weeks from now is Radhastami. So it's a very busy period, both you know internal bhajan life and also externally for Harikata and so many other things. So uh, I am trying to catch up with questions uh, by answering back directly in some cases and in some cases being able to if it's specially requested to do them on the forum here so i'm trying to answer one question that was asked by the persons who put the question forward to do it on this forum um i do want to say at the very beginning that um i did write back prabhu to both of you uh two prabhus and I wrote back to both of you that uh, first and foremost, um, we should, my Guru Parapadma has always told uh, that we should not criticize at all. Uh, I was very happy because in your posting of your question, there was not criticism, there was genuine inquiry. So that I felt very happy that it was not a, you know, a question filled with critical analysis of everything. Critique is one thing, um, but you know, sometimes it turns into just criticism of every thing and everyone. So I was happy that that did not take place and therefore I did not mind presenting the question on this forum and also um, trying to give some understanding as best I can. Uh, so the question was, as is posted, why, uh, what is the difference between various sanghas and why aren't they all sort of united is what you wrote. Uh, I put, I think, in the uh, title here, why aren't they all one, but I think you mentioned why aren't they all united, since the goal uh, is one thing. So first, perhaps the way to understand this is that uh, being united has different levels of perception. So united also always doesn't mean homogenous. So it does not mean that people who have the same goal necessarily have to operate in a structure that's, you know, just homogenous, that everybody has to be on the same uh, exact place, same time, same everything. So this oneness of purpose can be executed in diversity. So, for the most part, if you really look, all of the various Sanghas in the Gaudiya tradition, right? We have our Sampradaya, Brahma Mother, Gaudiya Sampradaya, and this is inclusive, really, of all of those who've come under the umbrella of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, in that regard, everyone is united in the vision that we are all the family of Mahaprabhu. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, there are so many breakdowns of various branches and sub-branches of the tree of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and everyone can trace their line to one uh, of these branches. So we are united in the family of Mahaprabhu. But uh, as you asked in the body of your uh, question, 
why was there, you know, divisions in terms of you asked about the Godiamat uh, and you said mentioned that you had read something regarding the breakup of the Godiamat and then you mentioned this Khan and the splintering in this Khan of some devotees going to here or going to there. So again, we can see that in a number of ways. One is that there's always some divine backdrop to everything that's touched by bhakti. And then there are also the external factors of various aspirants unfolding in the process. So <clears throat> in the case of the Godiamat, also, not let me make one point before that. If you go back and look after the disappearance of Sriman Mahaprabhu, you will also see that there was a divergence of opinions, there was various um, sort of groupings that took place. Uh, it's mentioned directly in Chaitanya Charitamrita that even three of the sons of Advaita Charja took a divergent opinion from that of Mahaprabhu and three sons followed strictly the path of Mahaprabhu. So the fact that it appears directly in Gore's Leela shows that it's not something that's abnormal or unusual. That especially after the Samadhi Lila of a great Acharya or a Sain Pati Bhakta, that you will find some upheaval in the Vaishnav Mandal and perhaps particularly in the uh, institution of that Acharya. So those are not unusual things. And what maybe exacerbates confusion around these sort of things is the pain or suffering someone may have had in relation to some aspect of the turmoil that evolved in the absence of that acharya. You understand? And then that, that leads to a sort of splintering that's based more on emotional, psychological traumas and that's its own thing, because that's where you'll find the bulk of, you know, sort of criticism and, and really sort of a, a combination of personal catharsis and projection in some cases, and also facts. I mean, there, there are facts that are also there, so it's not that people's trauma just came out of nowhere. It's actually, you know, factually based that people went through crises of faith, People may have gone through actual emotional, psychological traumas because of things that happened. But again, as I mentioned, there's always a divine backdrop to everything as well. And one feature of that is that the individual karmic unfoldment, the combination of material samskars and bhakti samskars of all of those who are aspiring in bhakti is also, um, so to speak, it's in the mix of things that are happening. So, for instance, if we come into a situation where there is some upheaval, uh, especially as I mentioned in the uh, absence of the prominence of the Prabhav, means the influence of an Acharya or Sain Pati Bhakta, then according to our own individual previous material and Bhakti Sangskars, we may face a particular challenge at that time. Uh, and in facing that challenge, there are a number of ways we can proceed forward. Um, I'll take two verses from the 11th canto because they epitomize what should be done whenever we face a crisis of any sort in bhakti. So, Jatasharam Akateshu, Nivigna Savakamashu, Vedatukat Manam Kamam, Paritagyopianishwara. So, it's mentioned in this verse that. Taking to the practice of bhakti, first there will be shraddha. Shraddha in both harikata, but especially first shraddha in sadhu sangha. Because harikata is the byproduct of true sadhu sangha. Satam prasanga mamavi sangvido vantirit kana nasanaya kata dishlok. You understand? So faith will first come, of course, adoshara means faith will first come as an influence to turn towards an alternative from the material world. That stage is called mati. I've explained this on previous um, sessions like this. Ratnya uh, Ankur, no, Sava Sangamena Ratnya Ankur, Ratnya Ankur, Rupa Eva Mati. Mati means 
when discrimination comes. This stage is actually a doshada. By some agyata sukriti, somehow or another, a person takes some contact with the influence of bhakti, and on the basis of that influence of bhakti, their discrimination kicks in and they think, oh, there must be something else besides this material world. Then that faith progresses to become faith in a sadhu. Understand? That's why the next level is sadhu sangha. But the previous level of faith is now matured to faith in a sadhu. From faith in a sadhu, you learn the process of bhajan, which involves hearing the harikata, and this is the shloka I quoted, satam prasangam mamavir samvido. In their prasanga, prasanga here means when the aspirant and the sadhu guru are both in the optimal position, then prasanga takes place. And by that prasanga, avanti ritkaran rasanayakata, then the instructions in harikata they give, it comes into the ear, but enters the heart, purifying the heart. Tajosan asu apavargavatmani. It gives release from pavarga. Pavarga means mm, the elements of material existence, for lack of a better word. Right? And rati bhakti anukramishuti. And then in a crumb, right, following one after another, firm faith will develop, then bhav bhakti will come, then praying bhakti will come. So this is the process. So in that shloka, I'm quoting from the 11th canto, it says, when we first take to the process, there may be many challenges that arise, and we may have difficulty being detached in pursuit of bhakti from those challenges. And it did not specify that the challenges will only come from what we formally perceive as external influences. But those challenges will also come from within our unfolding process in bhakti. So Vedadukatmanam Kama, we can have the ability to perceive our response to it, but we can't always control it. Paritya Gyopi Anishraha. But the Tobotita Mamprita Shradalu Dhirinishoy. That faith that was originally cultivated from Adoshara coming through faith in a sadhu, coming to Bhajan, hearing Bhajan instructions, and trying to progress through these anarthas, we should not give up that faith. Rather, we should double our investment of faith in the process of Sudabhakti. Hmm? That's what this very next verse says, right? And just a manal chamankamam dukkal dharakam shagariyan. And we should have some sense of personal repentance. So uh, the question could come here, wait a minute, I didn't do anything wrong. Whatever happened in the upheaval of the particular institution or sangha I belong to, whatever, that wasn't related to me. But that's why very importantly mentioned previously we should always think Certainly something in my own mm, sung scars has also produced the situation that I find myself in. Nothing happens in a vacuum. So if I came into an institution and there's some upheaval there, some crisis of faith evolves because there was some, uh, I don't know, uh, Persons may have not been qualified to act in the position of guru, or there may have been some racial element, misogynist element, this element, or that, so many different things, right? Still, I will have to take, for the progress in bhakti, some sense of self-contribution to whatever that is. Why? Because that's what allows us to keep a perspective that no matter what it is that happened, I will double down my faith in bhakti because I realize what I witnessed, experienced, or took part in was a misapplication of pure bhakti, not pure bhakti itself. So this is very, very important. The other thing is that various institutions can be seen from the perspective of the inspiration of Mahaprabhu to spread Krishna consciousness. If you will look, especially at the so-called breakup of the Gaudiya Math, there were many, many high class of Vaishnavas who were the disciples of Pujapat, Chula Bhakti Sri Thakur. And those mm, high class of Vaishnavas, because they have no Guru Abhiman, because they have no material Abhiman, so to speak, 
but they were steeped in absorption in the practice of bhakti, they had no tendency to step forward. I actually directly heard a lecture of Srila Bhakti Rakshak Shri Goswami Maharaj. And he mentioned, I am not a forward stepping person. This was the English words that he used. I'm not a, I believe, forward stepping person. So they did not have an inclination to, to all go out and get their own mats or start their own preachings or all become gurus. Do you understand? Uh, on the basis of that, some upheaval came in the Acharya ship at that time after the Samadhi of Bhakti Sanan Saraswati Thakur. There's so many different versions of this and I'm not going into the specifics of that. But that became a catalyst for many of these high class of Vaishnavas like Srila Bhakti Pramod Puri Goswami Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Daitya Mara Goswami Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Vidoy Ghan Maharaj, of course our Srila Prabhupada, right? To then take up the order and mission of Mahaprabhu as it descended to their Guru Parapadma and begin to avail themselves to the world. So in one sense, that was a very inspirational period. It could be looked at as all of the things or elements that went into the breakup of the Gaudiya Mata. And there is a very deep history and there were many things that, you know, on the surface level, uh, not looking at a deeper aspect, were very not good, it seems. But the outcome and the inner workings of, as I mentioned, the divine play took its role. And all of these stalwart Vaishnavas then manifested uh, all throughout different places in India, opening ashrams and so forth and so on. And in this way, the mission of Srila uh, uh, Bhakti Sanan Saraswati Thakur, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, going back to Srimad Mahaprabhu and Goswami Varga, that mission actually spread as a result of that. Out of that entire mix, of course, the fulfillment of Mahaprabhu's prophecy, our Srila Prabhupada became the Shaktivesh uh, Sarup of Sri Nityananda uh, Tattva and by that became the fulfilling of the prophecy of Mahaprabhu that Krishna consciousness would spread all over the world. Almost universally, all of those who came, especially within the Western world, to the path of bhakti came by the Prabhupada or influence of our Srila Prabhupada, his teachings, his books, etc. So, what about the situation in ISKCON? Again, uh, like if you look historically going back, anytime there is the passing or the Samadhi Lila of a great Acharya or Saint Bhakti Bhakta, there will be naturally some dust cloud that arises in the aftermath of that. So of course in the Samadhi Lila of Al Srila Prabhupada, also there was a dust cloud. And in that dust cloud, there was obfuscation of pure bhakti to some degree. So I'm not speaking to intention here because I'm not the antaryami. I don't know everyone's intention. And I also don't want to try to mentally critique everybody's intentions and this and that. What outcomes may have been there were there. But my, my own best interest is always moving forward in bhakti and also trying to inspire others, you should do the same. My Guru Parapadma told, don't criticize, try to do bhakti in a deeper way. So obviously what resulted in the absence of the incredible uh, shakti of Al Srila Prabhupada, uh, if you look in Srila Prabhupada's writings, more than 50 times he quoted one verse, Krishna Shakti Vina Nahe Tava Pavartana, and this one is specifically empowered so, of course, we understand how Srila Prophet was that kind of specifically empowered to create the fulfillment of the prophecy of Mahaprabhu and spread Krishna consciousness literally all over the world. And as a result of the, that kind of power in the Samadhi Lila being not as easily available, Gurudev's entrance into Samadhi does not mean Gurudev is gone. Dandavats uh, Ganga Didi. So uh, it does not mean Gurudev is gone. What it means is um, that Gurudev has now entered into Antradasha. Guru has three kinds of relations when they are in their Gora Rup. 
Bahir Dasha, external dealings. Art Bahir Dasha, half internal, half external dealings. And Antra Dasha, completely absorption in the inner Shuru and completely absorbed there. Samadhi means when they take that position of Antra Dasha, give up the physical facility or the gore root that we were used to seeing, and now it only allows the disciple access when the disciple is in their own depth of bhajan. So no more the Gurudev is appearing on the external platform, but Gurudev is always available to a disciple on the internal platform. So, but due to perhaps not a great amount of maturity, at that time you have to remember that the entire society was 11 or 12 years old at that point. So now many of us, I came to the path of bhakti in 1972, right? So, and I went through so many things, but you know, originally coming in 1972, you can see many devotees are practicing 40, 50, 60 years now, right? And certainly perspective, growth, inner realization, so many different things are different from at the time of practicing for 12 years. You understand? But at 12 years, those who were in the position of aspiration in bhakti took the reins. I'm not assessing any motives. I don't want to deal with that part of it. And someone else, if you like, I've already given my advice on it, but if you like, you can go down that track. But for whatever reason, those having that level of experience, not counting whatever previous bhakti some scars they may have had, took the reins from the same Pati Bhakta, Srila Prabhupada. Part of perhaps a great problem was not understanding, my Guru Parapadma used to make this statement, it is very easy to see the external features of how high a mountain is. Oh, Dandavas Jopati Didi, Charu Chandrika Didi, Jiva Pavana Prabhu. It is very easy to see the height of a mountain sticking up from, let's say, an ocean. But it is very difficult to see how deep that mountain goes down into the earth or into an ocean. You understand? So, from what was observable of our Srila Prabhupada, his activities, etc., there was more perhaps emulation of that than any genuine realization of the depth that produced that. So let me explain that. So in many cases, it may have been that what they saw in Srila Prabhupada's activities, how he was served as Guru, how he was worshipped as Guru, uh, mm, how he controlled the society, those external features, the Bahir Dasha, Lila, of Al Srila Prabhupada, that was what was prominently emulated by those who took the reins of the society. How deep was Srila Prabhupada's internal moods? We don't know how many had digested that. And those who had digested, how prominent they were in the administration and taking reins in the society. So I can distinctly remember, because I was present at that time, that in 1977, after the Samadhi Lila Vashri Prabhupada, there was a wide variety of opinion about what should happen. But there was also that nucleus that had pretty much control of things, and the ultimate outcome of what did happen was based in that nucleus. There was never a ballot sent around to the thousands of disciples and followers, what, what do you think? <laughs> right? So a decision was made by nucleus, and a certain amount of people were appointed to take the reins of Srila Prabhupada, again, after an 11 or 12 year period, not counting what I don't know, which is previous bhakti samskars, those persons took the reins and the position of the acharya. And mm, mm, I know for a fact that if we go on the basis of the Guru Tattva taught by Srila Prabhupada in his writings, he gave all the criteria. So we would not have had to do guesswork based on, you know, a last will and testament, or we would not have done, had to do guesswork on uh, you know, various letters and other things that were presented on two different sides of an argument about whether this was bona fide or not. The real discussion of whether or not it was bona fide 
uh, was based in the canon uh, of Srila Prabhupada's teachings of Guru Tattva. If the person had realization, were they Sastra Yukti Suni Punya even? Because even if someone is Sastra Yukti Suni Punya, Jurishwara Yandra, Uttamari Kari Se Kariya Sansar, if they have Uttamari Ka and eligibility to do sadhana, then Tariya Sansar, they can help others traverse the Sansar. So even in that position, coming into Majamari Ka, one may, if there is need or necessity, may take the role of giving Harinam and Diksha. But a hallmark quality of that person, based on being Sastri Yukti Suni Punya, is that they will have no Guru Abhiman. Because if you are Sastri Yukti Suni Punya, you will see that Guru Abhiman and the ability to realize the essence of pure bhakti, they do not go together. Raghunath Swami is written in Manasiksha, Pratishta Ashta Dras Vapatya Ramani Vridi Mainatet. That, that Pratishta Ash, which is a feature of Guru Abhiman, if that is present, Katam Sadhu Premas Prashakti Suchi Yir, Nanumana. How will it be possible for Nirmal Prem or pure realizations to enter the heart? Because that Pratishta Asha, desire for name, fame, worship, etc., it dances audaciously in the heart. And because of that, Bhakti Shakti will not enter there. You understand? So the idea of, of taking the mantle quote, of Srila Prabhupada's mission and having, perhaps due to not maturity at that time, Guru Abhiman, then it led to more external features of imitation or emulation of Srila Prabhupada. And in that situation, it created an undercurrent because then there were many disciples of Srila Prabhupada who felt, well, why was I not? part of that. Everything seems to have been generated from this letter, which only the nucleus were really privy to the development of, etc., etc. So, there was already an undercurrent. Of course, uh, moving ahead, when there was any crisis of faith that evolved from the inability to maintain due to lack of realization the responsibility for being the repository of people's faith, hence a crisis of faith for those who repose their faith in some persons who then fell away or deviated or did this or that, that also created a whole other upheaval. The responses to that were varied. So one response was to try to retrofit the concept of guru on the institution moving forward. So the idea of Ritvik Vad became popular. Then there was also a, another group, which is, this is around 1982 or something like that, I remember, maybe 82, 83, I cannot remember exactly. But then there was also a huge reform movement, which was composed of many other disciples and uh, not so much second generation disciples, but uh, disciples of Srila Prabhupada who would then say, well, listen, you, we can see that, you know, these people are not necessarily pure Vaishnavas, etc., etc., the truth about what is the standard for Guru Tattva and giving Harinam Diksha, all of that was still a little ambiguous, though it was present in Srila Prabhupada's books. And it was not ambiguous to everyone, by the way. There were many stalwart devotees at that time within Srila Prabhupada's mission who were just in their lane doing the service to Srila Prabhupada they had dedicated their lives to. So their input was not seen in the wires, so to speak. You know how uh, I remember... <laughs> I was serving one Vaishnav, and they used to have what, uh, what was a private chat room. I think this is when you know, this whole chat room thing came about. But in the private chat room, there was always, you know, conversation. This happened, that happened, this is what, that, this. And I found that the old Vaishnavas, our own name, like Apujapat Srila Gauragavin Maharaj, Apujapat Srila Radhagavin Maharaj, there's others, many others. But you never really saw so much participation in those chats which I, you know, by fortune became privy to, be, I was serving one Vaishnava who would tell what was going on, and they were not so much a part of those kind of things. But of those who were managing so much men, money, manpower, so many different things, you know, there was, they were prominent in this. And then also, uh, many other disciples who were disenchanted by what was happening, they were also chiming in. So anyway, that was the reform group. 
So you had the Rit Vigva, then you had a reform group, and then you had various now sort of conferences and confrontations and everything else around trying to adjust everything. Now here, I would say an essential thing that was missing was a direct instruction of Srila Prabhupada. If you have any philosophical questions, I recommend you go to my god brother, Srila Bhakti Rakshak Srila Maharaj. So our Srila Prabhupada had great faith in Pujapat Shuddha Maharaj to give advice and counsel on the Siddhant, which would help to mm, set a template by which everyone could operate. But once that was not accepted as a wholesale thing, some people did go to Shuddha Shuddha Maharaj. And of course, uh, Shuddha Prabhupada also told in his last days, uh, for my Guru Parapadma, that you should one put me into samadhi by your own hands. This is a relationship that has come from 1946-47 all the way to Srila Prabhupada Samadhi. So this is a very thick Vaishnav relationship. You understand with many things along the way, letters, so many things. So he said also, I want you to help my disciples. So we had two sources of very high quality realized Vaishnavs by which we could get advice, shelter, uh, you know, sort of reconciliation in many things. But you only had a certain group of devotees who, in a, who more or less were trying to double down their faith, took advantage of that and went to Srila Srila Maharaj or Srila Gurudev or someone to Srila Bhakti. Pramod Puri Maharaj, Bhakti Vai Bhakti Puri Maharaj, so many others, right? And began to try to elicit some reconciliation for these things and to move forward in Bhakti. There were those who were actually diametrically opposed to it. And perhaps it was because there was a fear of the presentation of the kind of Prabhav that Srila Prabhupada shined uh, on the society. And because of that, Maybe the attraction, the organic attraction for those wanting bhakti would have uh, uh, naturally moved in those directions. They felt, no, we don't want to take that chance and perhaps we should keep control of things by not allowing those influences in the society. So there are many other things which were never really truly substantiated, like they're teaching differently from Srila Prabhupada or they have a different mood than Srila Prabhupada. Right? There was never any real sit down and discussion with the larger body of devotees. There was obviously personal discussions with different devotees who they considered, you know, on a level to have discussions with them, but the wider body of devotees never were privy to those discussions. So there was never an insight into what is exactly meant by a different mood or what is meant by a different emphasis or different teachings. I'll give an example. There used to be one devotee who used to visit me regularly, both in Maryland and when I moved to Florida here. And he would come because he wanted to hear Harikata. So it was an opportunity for me to serve Harikata. So I was always availing myself. Yes, Prabhuji, anytime you can come or you can call. So once he called me and he spoke that his wife uh, was unhappy with his continued visits and coming to see me and so forth and so on. So I said, oh, well, perhaps you should bring her, I will come and visit you, and we can try to resolve what would the issue be. We were friends and so forth and so on, uh, and you've known me for many years. Uh, so he arranged for me to meet with his wife, and his wife, they came to visit me in my home, and we sat to talk, and I asked, you know, Didi, is there a particular reason why you don't feel, uh, or you're apprehensive about your husband coming to hear Harikata. She said, well, I spoke to an authority, I'm not mentioning any name, and that authority said that we should not come to hear because your Gurudev uh, gives a different emphasis. He emphasizes Raghunuga Bhakti. So I said, okay. Then I asked the question, so uh, do you know what is Raghunuga Bhakti? And there was silence. And then after a few minutes, there was almost a smile, I think, simultaneously on all of us because there was the epiphany that you've taken some advice and instruction about something
that you yourself didn't inquire about to get clarity on. You didn't ask the person, well, well what is this Raghunuga Bhakti? And why did Chula Prabhupada not give emphasis? You didn't do a background on it. You took on the basis of the submission to the idea of authority and you did not vet it or get an understanding of it. So now you were willing to perhaps cause trouble in your own marriage and also cause your husband not to be able to have the freedom of hearing Harikata according to his taste um, be over something you yourself didn't understand. So this was an example of generally what was happening in a larger uh, swarth of the society. That people heard, oh, Gurudev has a different mood, Shudamars has a different mood, Godiamat is a different thing, there's a different emphasis. But there was never really clarity or discussion about these things in the larger forum where there could be philosophical opportunity to see clearly what's being discussed, what is different, what's a different mood. So that just further began to splinter the society. At the same time, the external advancement of society was still going on. Temples are still being built. Congregational members are still being gleaned. Mm, donations still come in. You understand? So from the external mm, perspective about bhakti, everything seems to be bhakti is flowing. But we all know bhakti is not buildings, size of congregations. Bhakti is bhakti. Bhaktiya samjatya bhaktiya. Bhakti comes from bhakti. Those services are meant to invoke the kripa of guru to receive bhakti. They themselves are not a axiomatic indication of bhakti. You understand? Because then we'd have to say Fortune 500 companies, according to what they do, they must be imbued with bhakti because they're able to successfully manifest all of those things. So we have to look and see if bhakti was actually genuinely being grown or were the external features of the institution being grown? So these are hard questions. And one of the problems is that rather than asking these questions in great humility and with great sincerity to reconcile things, because people experience pain and suffering, as I mentioned earlier, there was an attack mode around these things. <laughs> you understand? So the Rick Dick's attacking from one direction, those who want to reform things, attacking from another direction, people who suffered trauma, emotionally, psychologically, etc., were attacking from another direction. And in spite of that, there seemed to be a thriving externally. So all of these things were certainly, you know, a, a right feel for a lot of confusion about what is ISKCON at this point. So of course, we have to go back and perhaps look at the original meaning of ISKCON according to Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada told that he took from Padjabali of Rupa Shamipad uh, one poetry. This was in a lecture in 19, I believe it was, I heard it this morning from Bhumipati Prabhu. He's the, he's the amazing source of all kinds of details about <laughs> where to find something. So he told me, it was a lecture given, let me just look at, let me just look back at it now because I want to get it correct because people may want to go back. And, yes, the lecture was in August 15th of 1972 in Los Angeles. And in that lecture, Srila Prabhupada mentioned that he took the name uh, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, or ISKCON, from the poetry of Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, which is the shlok, Krishna Bhakti uh, Rasa Bhavitamati Kriyatam Yari Kutopi Labhyate Tatra Mulyamapi Mulyamekalam Janma Koti Shukriti Nalabhyate. So in this shlok, Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, which is quoted in Pajavali, he says that mm, Krishna Bhakti Ras. Krishna Bhakti Ras is what Sriman Mahaprabhu came to give. That that Krishna Bhakti Rasa, if you find it available anywhere, this is a very important point, if you will find it available anywhere, because it is our aspirational goal. So if you will find what you're looking for any place, then you should run immediately to that place to acquire it. 
And what will you have to pay to get it? Hmm? Only your greed. Dr. Lolium Apimulimekilum. The only thing you need is Lolium. Your greed to have it. So of course we have to be careful to understand what is the real meaning of lobe or greed or lolium. What is the real meaning? Lolium is not a notion. Lolium can only really be truly realized when there's sarnagati. Because as long as you have self-interest, it is not truly spiritual greed. It is your own self-interest. And we'll see that play out by many devotees who kind of wanted to bypass the process of bhajan and immediately jump to the position of realizing what is my Siddha Deha, what is my Siddha Swaru. So I want to, if I can go and I can hear that from someone, right? Because Mahaprabhu himself is told, Namnam Akari Bahuda Nija Sarva Shakti Tatapita Niyamita Smaran in the color. In Hari Nam, I've not even given mm, Niyam. Niyam means so hard, fast rules and regulations. This is my Kripa. I've put Nija Shakti, all Shakti, in this Nam. So Hari Nam with Saranagati, because Prahalad Maharaj told, Shravan Kirtan Vishnu Smaran, etc., should be done, it keeps Aprita Vishnu Bhaktas Chinnavalakshin, when there's Saranagati. So Saranagati is not only the doorway to Bhakti, but it is the first Anga of Bhakti, Guru Pad Asraya. This is Saranagati. So, when you will do Saranagati and take Harinam and take Diksha, because Guru Parashaya, Tata, Diksha, Shikshari, Vishwam, Menu, Guru Sevi, etc. Doing this process, then the revelation of your Siddha Swarup will naturally evolve organically as you attentively practice Bhajan Sadhan. But if I will go and I will hear, oh, I am this Mm, particular identity. What will happen is that my material abhiman will add that to the collection of my material abhimans. I am uh, this, I'm a scholar, I'm this, I'm a kirtaniya, I'm black, I'm white, I belong to this group, I'm in that. And it will become part of the collection of different uh, self conceptions that you have. Because the ahamkara is still present. So Jeeva Goswami Pada is told in Bhakti Sindhava, Sudha Antakaran, Pratamam Nam Nam, Sudha Antakaran, Arthama Peksha. First the Antakaran means the subtle body should become purified. When the subtle body has become purified, Sudecha Antakaran e, ah, ah, Shravanam Rupam, Tad Udaya, Tad Udaya, Tad Udaya, Tad Bhakti Udaya Yogyata. At that time, naturally, organically, then your Vise Sambandha Gyan, given at the time of Diksha, will reveal itself. Of course, that revelation is coming in incremental stages, so it doesn't happen as necessarily one snap epiphany. One day I was chanting and boom, ankle bells and flutes. Throughout the entire process of your Bhajan Sadhana, when you do your Guru Dhyan through chanting Guru Ashtakam in the morning, Realization should be coming. When you will chant the Mangalarti of Param Guru Dev, right? Some realization should be coming. If you will chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, what is Hare Krishna should be understood clearly. Eight pairs of yugo, and in the eight pair yugo, meeting and separation are taking place. All these different things will come in incremental stages. And if you don't repose, means if you don't try to control bhakti by your own self-conception, oh, I'm not qualified, or you don't impose, yes, I'm now a manjari and I'm going to impose my conception, which is Prakita Sahajabhat, I'll impose my conception of my bhajan practice. We are the sakshi, we are the witness to the unfolding of bhakti. Do bhajan with deep sambandha gyan and watch the unfoldment of bhakti through the stages. You understand? So, my point here was that mm, originally the ability to glean all of these kind of teachings, they were kind of obfuscated by all of that turmoil. And therefore, mm, some sort of ceiling of what should be discussed and what should be understood.
came about in the institution so that there could be, what is it, conversational um, parity. In other words, we don't want one person discussing Bhav, what is Manjali Bhav, what is Rasa, what is Raga, and everybody else is still discussing you're not the body. So in that way, there became even a ceiling on how devotees' inspiration can unfold and at what rate people could actually progress in bhakti. For this reason, Jiva Goswami Pada is written in Bhakti Sindhava, the relationship with Guru should never be based on customary, social, hereditary, or ecclesiastical considerations. Al Srila Prabhupada quotes this in Ali Lila, chapter 1, text 35. He quotes Bhakti Sindhava in the purport. The nature of relationship with Guru Tattva should be on the basis of the inspiration coming from the understanding of Guru Tattva and the mutual pariksha, examination of the Guru to the disciple and disciple to Guru. Hari Bhakti Vilas says we should try one year in association. Pragmatically, it may not always be possible, but certainly there should be the ability to hear Guru speak Harikata, to observe the behavior of Shri Guru, and vice versa, Guru to Sishya. Right? So which means that we do not you know, go and give Harikata somewhere, see somebody and give initiations. <laughs> right? So uh, both extremes are not good. Also, the idea that, you know, as I mentioned already with Ritvigvad, that we will mm, create a standardized institutional feature of Guru, like with the Ritvigvad, that will just take everybody to Srila Prabhupada because we know he's a realized soul pure devotee. Because that also is stifling. Because the relationship with guru and disciple should be one where there is an active dynamic. Therefore, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, I think 158, it mentions there, Jive Sakshat Nai Chaitya Guru Rupe, Shiksha Guru Hoi Krishna Mahant Swarupe. Mahant means an external appearance of the Antaryami. Krishna's coming as the Shiksha. Antaryami is Shiksha Guru in the feature of the Mahant that appears, Srila Prabhupada directly writes, before the external senses of the aspiring devotee. You understand? So anyway, after some time, uh, with all of these various things going on, many devotees took to the realization that I have to take up my best self-interest in terms of spiritual life by seeking out where, according to this verse that describes Iskand, which was my original point, where I will find the teachings that will lead to the goal I aspire for, Krishna Bhakti Rasa Bhavitamati. Where I can understand and realize that, that's where I'm going to repose my faith, either in the form of Diksha or Shiksha. You understand? That also is not absent in, in any society. Gaudiyamat, Iskand, the Pariwars, every place you can find this. But the point is finding it. And probably in conclusion here, because I've been going for some time, this is the meaning of Iskand. Krishna Bhakti Rasabhavi Tamati, this shlok, this is the meaning of Iskand. So Iskand is not an, just an acronym and a collection of buildings and so forth. This verse is Iskand. And if you are in line with this verse, you are in Iskan. My Guru Parapamri used to always say that. Who in the line of Mahaprabhu was not in Iskan? Who was truly in the line of Mahaprabhu who was not in line with this verse, therefore in line with Iskan? So it's very important. Again, my Guru Parapamri was also very keen to make us all realize and act according to being the family of Mahaprabhu. He did not make distinction. If it's traditional Pariwar, if it is Godiamat, if it is Iskan, if it is any other bona fide following of Mahaprabhu that's now taken a different nomenclature. That is Mahaprabhu's family, and we are part of that. Understand? So hopefully, Prabhu's, uh, both of you, <laughs> And I hope your practice is going well. I will let you know uh, when we're having the Bhakti Intensive. Uh, the, the, I know it's in June so far, 
and I believe we've located a place in Virginia. Uh, we did it in South Florida over two years, then of course this year because I traveled, I did not do it. So I think this year we'll do it in Virginia. I will make the information available uh, in general for people who want to come, uh, but uh, I will definitely get it to both of you. Uh, in this case, it's not so far from you, so you wouldn't need a flight or anything. You could drive from where you're located, right? I think it's maybe a seven or eight hour drive, but you could drive there from where you're located, right? All right, um, let me think if I, anything I wanted to add that I did not. No, I think pretty much I, I wanted to make the point. Let me maybe summarize a little bit. One is that bhakti is not an institution. Bhakti is swatantrata. It's independent. And bhakti comes from bhakti. I quoted from 11th Canto Bhagavatam. Bhakti sanjatya hatya. Bhakti comes from bhakti to a sadhu. You understand? Krishna bhakti jama mulahoi sadhu sangha. So bhakti comes from a sadhu. So our interest is in sadhu. And Jiva Goswami Pad described what is a sadhu. Sadnoti sadhaiti cha Krishna premiti sadhu. That person who's understood the sadvastu, ultimate reality to be Krishna prem, that person is sadhu for us. And doing there, uh, anugamana means anugatya, means anugamana means following them. Anu here has three meanings I mentioned before. It means to follow them continuously without deviation or break and with anuttva means humility. So this is called doing sadhu sangha. So this is our greatest self-interest because from the sadhu, the potency of Sahib Shakti is coming through. In the verse I quoted earlier, Sattam prasanga mama virya samviro. Mama virya means swarup shakti. It's translated many times as my wonderful, powerful activities, but the activities in leelas of Krishna are viewed with swarup shakti. <laughs> so when they're coming from the transcendental heart of any realized sadhu, they're imbued with swarup shakti. And it is this swarup shakti by its prabhav that creates the gradual unfoldment, which is in the last line of that verse. Shraddha, Rati, Bhakti, Anukramishiti. It creates this crumb of incremental unfoldment in Bhakti. So, this is our primary goal. At the same time, we should not pick up the mode of criticism towards Bhakti, towards institutions, towards Vaishnavas, whatever situation they might be in. It doesn't mean that we are open to the tolerance of abuse. Uh, and other sort of things that that's not those two things are not in the same track right so we have to be responsible in any social body to mm, deal with those things which are abusive um, mm, which are unhealthy those things should be dealt with but we should not about sudden but we should not develop a malice because in your bhajan sudden that malice will remain there as part of a weed in your garden of bhakti. <laughs> you understand? If you will speak truth, if you will speak siddhant, in itself, the siddhant, being fully imbued with the potency coming in Guru Parampara, that is enough to correct anything that is wrong. We don't need malicious crusades against things. Right? Now, pragmatic issues is another thing. If there is some actual abuse, I, my own feeling has always been it should be taken to law enforcement. <laughs> Not because I previously was in law enforcement, but because <laughs> that's the actual standard. You, you know, that sometimes has to be the deterrent and also the, the reality that if you will harm someone else, especially children or anything else, that should be taken to law enforcement. That should not come within the jurisdiction of the institutional body where there may be allegiances, this, that, and so forth, so on. So that way there's a very objective standard like there is in society at large for dealing with things. But that aside, in general, what philosophical or other kinds of lack of inspiration may have been um, grown out of, you know, the, as I mentioned very early on in the talk today, the, the sort of almost natural phenomenon that happens after the disappearance of a great devotee, then those things don't become absorbed in critical mentality about. Do your bhajan sadhan, speak the truth according to your realization best you can, and praying always for the mercy of Guru Vargas, everything will become adjusted by that power. Because we're not kartata, we're not the doers in this regard. 
We are witnesses and we are sevaks. <laughs> so in that regard, this is one of the meanings of Rakshishti Vishwas. Having a Vishwas that Krishna is protecting and Gopta Vevaranam Tata, maintaining everything. Okay. All right, my Dandabhat Pranam, uh, Prabhus, both of you. Vrancha Kalapatur Vishya, Kripa Sindhavai Vishya, Patina, Pavne Vaishnava Vivyana Maha. Equally to all the devotees who are on and who are listening, uh, a very high class esteemed devotees on. I saw that Chandra, uh, Chandra, Chandra Kadidi, many others, so many devotees, Panda Prabhu, so many other devotees are on. So please give me your mercy and give me your blessings also for continued service to Hari Guru Vaishnava. Jai Radhe Radhe.